regard, and eventually part of this talk will be essentially how you go from having an idea in the lab and actually get people to buy it and make money off of it. And the other half is just about kind of the, the day job, how to, how to have a career in engineering. Okay, so first, um, biomedical engineering. How many of you here are engineers? I assume all of you are engineers in some capacity? Is anybody biomedical engineering or interested in, in that? Okay, so a few people interested in, in biomedical engineering. So I chose biomedical engineering because it's kind of a combination of physics and science and biology, and I liked all three of those things. I thought they'd go together. So um, just a quick background is I started out at the University of Michigan in physics, and I think you guys are all in high school, so you're not quite in the college stage yet, but when you get to college, you have to pick a major. I picked physics. Kind of three years into my physics career, I realized this is way too hard for me, and I ended up having to drop out of physics. It was a big, kind of a big emotional crisis of figuring out what, um, what I'm going to do with my life because I thought I was going to be a physics major for all through college, and I ended up uh, switching to biology and staying an extra year. So my college was actually a five-year program instead of a four-year program. But um, in the end, I went to grad school. I had to decide kind of what I wanted to do, so I ended up going to biomedical engineering grad school kind of a combination of physics and biology. And I had to end up taking the physics classes that I ended up dropping out of in college in grad school anyway. So it was kind of like maybe in college I wasn't ready for it, but in grad school somehow the second time around it was easier. <coughs> then um, then I got an MBA fairly recently, went back to school and got an MBA in my late thirties. So you kind of it's never too late to keep going to school and hopefully don't add up all these years of school because it'll scare you. You'll probably do it a lot more efficiently. <laughs> if you try. So that's, that's academia. Uh, work, I think um, when I got out of grad school, I joined an IT consultancy company and basically flew around the world installing software, doing kind of programming integrations. It was very cool, just got to work in Japan and Australia and do a lot of cool things. But I wasn't that into the IT side of things and packet switching and IP addresses and so I knew I liked biology more, so I kind of had a, another crisis of figuring out what I want to do with my life. And I thought I want to work in biotech, I think. For me, it was more interesting. So I ended up joining a biotech in Boston and then moving to Singapore and helping them set up another biotech company that made uh, cancer drugs, essentially, in Singapore. And that eventually got shut down because the drug didn't work that well. And so I came back to New York, uh, got an MBA, and joined a strategy consultancy. You guys know anything about strategy consulting? that crossed your radar yet? And, uh, that's probably good. <laughs> but So strategy consulting is kind of, after you finish college, uh, a lot of people end up going into these kind of big three or big four consultancies where you essentially get hired, you get paid pretty pretty good, and you travel around and you go to clients and you solve technical problems, or you solve kind of managerial problems for them, and you're, you're essentially a problem solver, kind of a jack of all trades, whether it's in, in a specific technology sector or it could be even though you're an engineer, you could end up in finance or in, in defense or in, in healthcare. And that's kind of a good way to, if you're not sure exactly what you want to do or your perfect job's not out there yet, just joining a management consultancy until you can figure that out. Or you can just stay in there forever and become a partner. You do pretty well, too. So I was doing that up until basically a year ago, and then I just joined Pfizer, which is on 42nd Street, their headquarters. And if you don't know Pfizer, they basically are one of the bigger drug companies in the world. Eliquis, Viagra, Lipitor, and uh, a lot of cancer drugs as well. So it's very interesting to be in that environment that's very scientific, still very engineering, although I don't touch a calculator or do anything except work in Excel and PowerPoint at this point. But it's very much um, it's a combination of science and business and very hardcore science. So it's, it's a huge company, but they still care a lot about science. So. And that's, that's where we're in right now. So I guess for you, things to think about is picking a major, and I guess the, the only thing I can impart is that sometimes you, when you go to when you go to college, you don't always know what your major is going to be. You kind of have a sense. I think being in engineering or being in something hard is is important because I definitely know after the fact when we're looking to hire people, if they go with a degree that seems easier for some reason, like psychology or whatever. My parents psychologist, but okay, I was going to say that. If you go, if you 
pick a degree that you think will be easier in college because you can get, be able to get better grades, it's better to go with things that people know are hard, like engineering, physics, or biology, some of the life sciences, assuming that interests you, and you kind of take the easy route. But also be aware that it's okay if you get into the major and you think your whole life you're going to be an engineer. You get into year one or year two of engineering, and you're like, this sucks, and I can't deal with it, and you switch into something else. Because eventually, either be a job or be a grad school or be your MBA, you'll come back to whatever you're, what you like and what you're good at, and it doesn't matter if it's not exactly electrical engineering or civil engineering that you thought you were going to go into. They kind of all, all things. Uh, I think when I was in college, I did a lot of work study, work in the lab. It's a good way to kind of get experience at the university, get to know professors, and kind of figure out more if you want to work in the lab or or what, what type of engineering work you want to be. Um, for me, industry, well, grad school is also an option to get down, but that's kind of four years away, so it's probably scary to think about that if you haven't even gone to college yet. But it's out there, and it's not as terrible as you think it might be. Uh, the industry is, for me, that was a big question. So when you're your own engineer and you're trying to figure out, like, does that mean I'm going to work for a big engineering firm or a startup or have my own company? going to be an engineering, and I guess there's actually lots of ways to be an engineer and not be in classical engineering firms. So you can be a management consultant, which a lot of people end up doing because they get sick of working in labs at, at some point. Or they go into biotech, which is um, no matter what kind of engineer you are, there's tons of work in the biotech area, not just actually processes and reactions and that kind of thing. It can be just a strategy for a pharmaceutical company. And then way down the road, you can decide if you want an MBA. kind of it in a nutshell, so then um, does anybody have any questions about kind of what biomedical engineers can do? Yeah, sure. Uh, do you know if there's like a big uh, industry in biomedical robotics and like instruments? There, there is, yeah. It's definitely not as big as pharmaceuticals um, and medical devices, but it, but there is, there are a bunch of companies, a lot in Boston also, so you, you may not be able to do it in New York, but if you're open to Boston, uh, Minneapolis, and on the West Coast, there's, there's tons of kind of smaller companies, but then you have some of the bigger defense companies also work in there. And then, of course, like Da Vinci and some of these surgical equipment companies definitely would hire bioengineers. And the other kind of career path that I've seen people do well at is um, as a sales engineer. So you basically you work with these biomedical companies that have, say, a, an implant or something like that, and you actually go into the surgery, scrub up every morning, go in with the doctors and help them because you're the expert on this implant or device or robotic equipment. You have to scrub up also. You go in there every morning with surgery and work with the surgeons and you're kind of like a, a part-time surgeon essentially. And it's a, it's a pretty good career for people who do that. But it's the same thing. So it's there's like the actual manufacturing side and there's the actual uh, using the equipment also. And sometimes it's a cyclical thing to do both. Yes. Um, so I was talking to my mom the other day, and we were just talking about like industries and sort of what the next industry would be. And he said that biomedical uh, and ro biomedical engineering and robotics is probably going to be like the next sort of uh, stage, you know, in you know, the next like, big industry. Yeah. Um, when when do you think that that industry will really sort of take a speed? Yeah. Sure. So yeah, the question is when. When will biomedical robotics kind of reach maturity where it's a, a viable career? And I think it's there already. I mean, there's definitely jobs. It's not huge, but I think there's, I don't think it's saturated as far as employment goes. Uh, a lot, kind of where the, the biggest movement right now is in genomics, and, in genomics, so gene sequencing, all the sequencing technology, bench top sequencing is getting more and more widely used. So. If you can sequence your genome for a thousand dollars, that has a trickle-down effect to all these other kind of things. So it's not—I mean, it is robotics in the sense that, that the robots are actually moving samples around and doing sequencing. In that sense, it's not as exciting as like a, a hoverboard or a, a tank, but it's a kind of robotics. So laboratory robotics are big. So, but I think uh, I think it's already there. It's just not as big as say like pharmaceuticals. But it's, but if you want to kind of see where the future is going, it's definitely genomic science and, and the equipment and robotics that go along with sequencing and, and uh, genomics. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. 
anything else on biomedical engineering, grad school, majors? Yes. How many hours do I work? Since it's recording, I, I feel embarrassed to say, but it's, it's uh, not that much. I mean, I work nine to five, basically. I have two little kids, so that kind of gives me an excuse to go home and leave them, but it's... Pfizer's been pretty good about just a normal 40-hour work week, and you check your email at night when you go home, but other than that, not too bad. The uh, consulting is, is a little bit different, so sometimes consulting, it could be... You, the way it usually works is Monday morning, you fly somewhere, and then you come back Thursday, and then Friday you're in the office, so you travel four days out of the week, which is fine when you're young, but it gets harder when you have kids. And there... Actually, I didn't find the hours that bad either, except for that you're gone and you're in a Marriott hotel somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But the hours weren't that bad. So, so, so far, I've never had a job that's like crazy 80 hour work weeks or anything like that. But I guess I might just give up. Or lazy. Domination problem. Anything else? Yes. What do you do on a day to day basis? Ah, so. It's, it's interesting. So strategy for, for R&D is a lot of about looking at the portfolio. So we have 150 different compounds. So we work with a group that figures out kind of how much those are going to be worth when they actually come to fruition. We look at uh, kind of what the competitors are doing also to see like the specific kind of like gene therapy or, or cancer, where, where we think our competitors are going and if we think our drug is going to arrive too late to that market what we're going to do about it, whether it's buy a different drug instead or cancel a program because we're going to need a third drug in that specific type of cancer market. So that's, I mean, that's kind of the problems we face. What I actually do is I just go into the office, read your emails and have meetings and make PowerPoints to explain this to somebody. Like this, we work basically for the head of R&D who works for the CEO. So essentially our enabling the guy that makes the decisions about the drug company, uh, the drugs to make decisions about which diseases to go after and which uh, drugs to focus on. That's the most of it. A lot of meetings, a lot of PowerPoint, some Excel still, and that's about it. But. Yeah. Anything else? If not, I'll switch over to the flip side of things, which is uh, bringing products to market. So, kind of one other thing that you can do all your life is you can always invent things, and I think all you guys here definitely seem like you're way ahead of where I was in the inventing world. It was, I, I, I've had a couple products on the market. One of them that uh, I just helped develop, which is the keyboard wall flyer, and the sponge tray here is something that I, I, I invented on, on my own. Um, and I guess basically I just want to talk to you about like how to go from an idea, like a bench top idea, to something you can make money on and actually sell to the market. And that's kind of people always ask me, how do you actually get something in bed, bath, and beyond? For instance. So we had the keyboard wall flyer. We, got it in Bed Bath and Beyond, and so uh, it actually wasn't that great there. We didn't sell that much, so it's actually not a dream to get in Bed Bath and Beyond in the end anyway. But, uh, so the first one is the sponge. So how many people, and this is an example of how uh, not everybody's going to like your idea, how many people have two sponges in their kitchen? Oh, wow, okay. And why, why do you have two sponges? Uh, for meat dishes and dairy dishes. Ah, uh, okay. For sure. <laughs> What about non non religious? Is there any non religious reasons why you have it? Yeah, go ahead. Just in case of um, stairs. Okay, like a backup sponge. So yeah, so that's good. Usually, it's kind of roughly half people have two sponges, half people have one sponge, and then bad math. But the other half have uh, don't use sponges at all. Anyway, so this is basically just a little metal shelf that says like good sponge, like your your meat sponge or your your dairy sponge, and it says good sponge and evil sponge. And I just developed it because I had a roommate who had one sponge for like a cat dish. I didn't want that going on my dishes, but it seemed kind of gross, but there's no way to separate them. So I kind of came up with a little stainless steel bookshelf, hey Rob, to, uh, to separate the sponges. So that's the idea. Uh, you can buy it in a couple different places, and it's probably sold a million dollars worth of revenue at least over, over about four years. So it's, it's kind of a slow burn project, but over time, uh, it doesn't go away. There's no kind of limit on on it. So in some sense, it's kind of a nice kind of little side project in the revenue stream. So, kind of how did how do you get it into the world? So 
think where you guys are at right now is it's design phase, first you just have to design it. Um, you all know that, make a prototype. And then I think where you probably would need help is once you get it past the prototype stage, how do you actually patent it, manufacture it, and uh, get it to the market? Those are all equally hard and depend on the product. Sometimes the design is harder than the actual selling it, sometimes the selling it is harder than the rest. So I'll kind of quickly kind of go through each step. So the design part, so I was biomedical engineering, so I didn't really know how to do CAD, and that was a limitation. So I just did PowerPoint because that's what I know, and this is just an early sketch up of it. I used PowerPoint and then Google SketchUp because it was free, and then I hired somebody on Craigslist to convert it to a CAD program that you could actually use for a manufacturer. So even if you don't know how to do 3D drawings or use a 3D printer, there's always somebody you can hire for 10 bucks an hour who can actually convert your concept into something that a manufacturer can use. So design is the first step. Um, then the next step is how do you prototype it? So obviously 3D printing is an easy way to do things if they're shapes. Um, there's a lot of places called rapid prototype shops. I'm sure, you, I, I know you're using them for integrated circuits here as well, but there's also companies that will actually manufacture um, the housing and different, different products for you. Even in America still, you can find these places. You can just Google rapid prototyping shops and they'll, for a couple hundred bucks, make you a single prototype. And there you have something. Uh, that you can show to people and get ideas and see if it's any, uh, it's any good. Then the, the big, kind of that's where a lot of people stop, because it's, you have a prototype, then you have to, if you go and you figure out, okay, I'm gonna actually manufacture it, I need to do, you have to go to China probably, you have to make uh, the tooling costs, which is like 40,000 or so for a, a tooling, if you have any kind of injection molded plastic, or even metal, I had to get some tooling for that. So. This is where people often freeze up, I guess, and, and don't don't continue. So what I've done a couple different things. For me, I use just uh, I got I got a firm order from a catalog for like a hundred units, and then I had some confidence that if I invest five thousand dollars in metal tooling, I'll get that back because at least I have some some orders ahead of time. For the keyboard waffle land, we we did a Kickstarter program. The last page of this is Kickstarter, I'm sure. Has everybody heard of Kickstarter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was a Kickstarter program. I think it was 50K was the uh, mm -hmm. break-even point or the minimum that we got 65K or so. So that that covered basically just the first batch and it covered the, the uh, injection mold tooling, uh, tooling for the actual keyboards itself. And the handles we found on Alibaba and uh, have them assemble it in, in China. So it's, it's uh, definitely sticking point of figuring out how you're going to pay for that first big or the first moving from prototype stage to, to scale up. But crowdsourcing is a good way of getting a firm order from somebody or just um, taking the risk and trying to um, just take, take the plunge and uh, borrow money from your family and former friends. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the scale up part. Yeah, and so then uh, the Kickstarter program. So I can just tell you about my experience. Has, has anybody been on Kickstarter yet? Yeah. How'd it go? Um, I never actually used it. I just started looking at projects. And oh, okay. I, them and I was going to donate. And then okay. Like, you know. so has anybody actually put a product on there to, to get Kickstarter yet? So it's too, it's too soon. So hopefully, oh, you have. Yeah. What, what was it? It's like a machine for our school device. Oh, nice. Five thousand dollars. Cool. And did you, did you get it? Uh, yeah. Excellent. So it's good. It's, it's a little bit diluted. There's a bunch of different sites now, like Indiegogo, uh, that all do this. And so, yeah. So we, we got our, our fifty thousand, and I can kind of tell you. I mean, the plus side is you get the money paid for the forty thousand dollars of tooling, and, if, and everybody got. I think like eighty people got keyboard waffle irons, and then we had no money again because because we basically just made enough money to pay for the first batch and pay for the tooling save for the next batch. So we still had to, the, the main inventor, Chris Dino, of this uh, had to kind of dip into the savings again every year for in inventory. But uh, I guess things we learned is shipping is expensive and Kickstarter doesn't cover shipping. So often these things are really heavy. So it costs 20 or $30 to ship it to someone from Alaska, which is still in the US, orders it, and then all of a sudden you make negative money for anyone when you ship in Alaska. So it's, it's some things we didn't think about. Um, the other thing is that it's actually, you can easily get lost 
within Kickstarter, so you can have anybody can set up a, a fund. Um, they have to approve it, so it has to be within. You have to actually have a prototype. Our first time around, we just had an idea. We knew we were going to make this. We had the drawings, so we didn't actually have a physical prototype. So um, they they rejected it. So we went back to the drawing board, and we we're kind of nervous that we we're going to get kind of the red some kind of red badge because we had been rejected from Kickstarter. But actually, they let us come back on once we had. Uh, I think we had a 3D printed version of it, and that was enough for them to actually call it a prototype. Um, but but the, the big issue is just getting off the Kickstarter because you're you're with 10,000 other people every day. There's a thousand new projects on Kickstarter. So just because you have a great idea and you put it up there, people won't find it. So Chris used kind of social media. He used all his contacts and the TV world to try to get advertisements and get people to go to it. And literally, like in the last day or so, we finally got about 50,000. But if we hadn't, then all goes away. You don't meet, you don't meet your minimum on Kickstarter. You just you end up with zero, which is really scary. So that's that was the keyboard wall selling. That's still selling in um, you get in Bed Bath and Beyond, Hammerfish Slammer, uh, online, and keyboardwallselling.com. Uh, this bunch you can only get on uh, Uncommon Goods right now. It's just an exclusive with them, but they've they've been pretty good, so I've kept it just for fun. So this is Barbara Poker, and we went to a, like a mini mini Shark Tank uh, with her her ABC, and she uh, we went over the keyboard waffle there and just punched her with her and got some advice. And spent like a, an hour with her. It was actually pretty good. Uh, her advice was that the sponge shirt, because it's only about five dollars to make, you can make a lot of money for it. And this, uh, we need to figure out a way to make it cheaper because it actually is it's an awesome product, but it's just uh, still kind of an expensive thing to make. It's got a lot of aluminum in it, and so you got to make your products cheap because no matter say you cost ten dollars to make, you will sell it for twenty dollars, and then a catalog. Or a store will, hold, will sell it for 40. They always it's kind of a double in each step. So if you want to sell this for 19.95, that means you have to sell it to the catalog for 10 dollars. Means it has to cost five dollars to make, which is very hard with a piece of heavy aluminum. And everything that you make it here, you have to think about that as well. There's going to be three steps. So whatever it costs you to make, it's going to be three times more expensive in the store. So everybody can make at least. And so you have to consider that as you're designing. Uh, Um, I guess my advice is always check your idea on Google because a lot of times people come to me with ideas and I just Google it and it's already out there, you can just buy it. So it's worth just Googling it. Um, don't worry if people think it's a stupid idea. So for definitely for the, the waffle iron and sponge shirt, about half the people you talk to think it's the dumbest thing they've ever heard of. And even in, in business school I did the sponge shirt as a project and I couldn't get anybody to be in my group because I thought it was such a stupid idea that nobody would ever buy like a little bunk bed for your sponges. So, and definitely some people, you don't need everybody to buy it, you just need, uh, I mean, there's 330 million people in the US alone, so you don't need a huge number of people to make some money. Um, also, I would say avoid those <coughs> things like invent help on, on TV, I don't know if you've seen that. There's certain things like the George Foreman advertisement on TV that helps you invent things. I think I looked into that when I first got started, and it turns out, they take a huge cut, and they basically take everybody, so there's no bar, so you can have the dumbest idea in the world. They'll be like, oh, it's a great idea. Give us $5,000 and the rights to your product. They don't do anything with it. They just put it in a database, uh, so they can say they put it in a database, and you're out $5,000, and that's it, and they also have rights to it after that. So it's kind of a dangerous thing to do uh, unless you're really, really desperate. And uh, yeah, you can keep inventing no matter what you end up doing. Bar, especially with the digital things, you know, you can do that uh, on your own with free time. And, uh, that's it. So. <laughs> My contact details Michael Frank, MichaelGFrank.com. You can uh, let me know if you want any of these products or any, any uh, advice. I'm happy to give you advice for contacts. Um, considering like in this day and age, like almost like everything you could poss possibly think of is like probably invented already. What uh, what would be your advice to uh, come up with an idea on our 